Well, welcome back. No joke this week. I sat down to try to write one, and it was just taking too long. It would have been faster to just read the title. So, this week, we are going to be looking at Community. Community is a really big deal in Unwanted, which is where we're going to be reading today. It's such a big deal that the author included four whole chapters revolving around building a community and how you invest in a community and how they serve you and how you serve them and find a purpose in them. It, it really is a big deal. Like about a fifth of this book is dedicated to this idea of community, which... I normally don't do. I normally pick like a chapter and we'll run through that chapter really quick. Maybe I'll grab a passage or two from other places. I don't normally grab four chapters and condense them down. So we're going to try to get through a lot this week. But at the same time, it might be a little short. <laughs> so with that said, we're going to jump right into the book here. Starting in chapter 17, starting with freedom. Uh, when we are entrenched in the ruts of our unwanted behavior, our motivation to change is rooted in the desire to be free from our behavior. Many people live their lives attempting to be free from difficulties such as sin, addiction, anxiety, and depression. This approach sets us up to toil in endless battles, measure our success based on our win and loss record, and ultimately live like prey to the predatory difficulties of life. This method is exhausting and increasingly foolish, as it is rooted in an effort to manage our sin. The alternative to a freedom from approach is to ask yourself, what might freedom be for? Consider a few questions for yourself. Why do you want to be free? Who are you doing all of this for? What hope and accomplishments might you be free to pursue if they weren't undermined by your unwanted sexual behavior? Pondering what freedom is for invites you to shift your focus from fixing yourself to an ability to dream redemption for a soul steeped in shame. If your hope is not moving your story into greater passion and comfort, your desire for freedom is too small. So how does that tie in with community? Well, we've been talking, we've talked in the past about accountability groups and I think those are important, but we're going to kind of talk about a, a flaw that they fall into here in a second. And I talked um, a couple weeks ago about uh, confession and the important role that that plays. And so now here's where we actually want to guard against uh, the problems that those fall into and how to properly deal with them. So accountability, and I feel s slightly called out by this. <clears throat> uh, back in the book, he says, ask most millennials about their experiences with accountability in the church, and you will typically get a smirk or a look of worry. An accountability partner was essentially there to have a front row seat to the bad sexual things you did in your life. Accountability became a form of Christian voyeurism. Now this passage is from a different part of the book, but I wanted to include it here because I think this is, it sums it up. If you want to change this experience of accountability, the focus must shift from voyeurism into one another's failures to mutual participation in one another's holistic lives. Accountability became a form of Christian voyeurism. My clients and friends have told me about accountability jars where you had to put between $1 and $20 in if you masturbated, looked at porn, or went too far with your significant other. My friend Jeremy recently told me about a viral meme from when he was in college that said, Every time you masturbate, God kills a kitten. Years later, after this generation completed college and started their careers, the struggles remained the same and they became increasingly disillusioned with the word accountability. The reason most relationships of accountability fail is that a person attempts to regulate the other's behavior without understanding the wider story of struggle in that individual's life. Consider these examples. 
Will software alert you to the reality that when your spouse gets promoted at work, you, in your envy, become drawn toward a deeper involvement in pornography or an affair? Have church communities trained accountability partners to recognize that a person's unwanted sexual behavior may in fact be a repetition of early childhood sexual abuse? For this to change, your task is to invite your community to turn from the policing of bad behavior to setting a stage for transformation. When my clients report beneficial experiences with accountability, they tend to tell me two things. First, the group's emphasis is on the key drivers, past and present, that influence unwanted sexual behavior, rather than a heightened focus on maintaining purity. Second, the group emphasizes mutual participation and personal growth, rather than dwelling on the powerlessness of their addiction or compulsive behavior. We have to shift the focus from voyeurism in, into one another's failures. We're taking our eyes off of just how many times did you fail this week or this month or that too. We're going to participate t- together in each other's lives holistically, the whole thing. I really like that. Next, let's talk about purity. A great deal of damage has been done to those who struggle with unwanted sexual behavior due to a misguided theology of purity that reduces sexual struggle to pure and impure behavior or wins versus losses. My clients often remark that purity theologies often feel similar to the story of Sisyphus in Greek mythology. Sisyphus's Sisyphus's punishment was to push a boulder up a hill only to see it roll down again. He repeated this action for eternity. When you are struggling with unwanted sexual behavior, the boulder you spend most of your time attempting to push up a hill is purity, even if purity is used interchangeably with the word sobriety. Unfortunately, this is encouraged by many Christian books and organizations that naively believe regulating purity will transform the lives of those most vulnerable to sexual brokenness. A major point of the Gospels is to show that efforts to purify oneself are not only pointless, but also destructive to those most likely to be condemned as impure by the religious establishment. Jesus is ferocious with the experts on the law and lays into them for the additional burdens they place on the most vulnerable. In Luke 11.46, he replies to the religious establishment, You experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Those struggling with unwanted sexual behavior do not need to be further loaded down with condemnation for their inability to reach purity. When purity culture becomes synonymous with surveillance culture, it must be seen as bordering on heresy. If you are a Christian, you must remember that the issue of purity has already been addressed once and for all in the death of Jesus. There is no sin, past, present, or future, that you can commit that is not atoned for in Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. You cannot become any purer in the future than you already are, even in the height of your acting out. Therefore, efforts to avoid lust or beat yourself up for a failure to reach purity are null and void. Your purity has already been accomplished and applied to your identity. If the crosshairs of accountability are not aimed at purity, what should be the focus of accountability in the context of community? Richard Rohr argued that the most damaging aspects of someone's life is not his or her failure, but being disconnected from others. When we disconnect from community and our maker, the inevitable fallout will be lives that wither and rot. The distinction is paramount for you to understand. You do not wither and rot because of your sin. You wither in sin because you are disconnected from the vine. This disconnection, this disconnected self is what Jesus addressed in John 15, five through seven. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up thrown into the fire, and burned. 
If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Communities are at their best when they create space for individuals to explore the many reasons that connection has been so difficult. In this way, connection is an invitation, not a dogmatic demand in order to have a proper standing before God. Remember, relationships are the primary place of wounding in people's lives. Therefore, when joining a community, people's caution and suspicion naturally rise to the surface. In the John 15 passage, notice that even Jesus does not demand that others connect to him. His approach is more existential, like saying, you want to be free of sexual sin? Well, you can, if you abide in me. A few lines later, in case there's any doubt creeping in about your ability to truly abide in him, Jesus brings you back to the most important image. God is in relentless pursuit of you. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love, in verse 9. God's design for sexual transformation is about a connection to love, not the fear of wrath. Shame aims to convince us that our unwanted behavior must be stopped before we can connect to others. Nothing could be more counterproductive. We connect so that we can heal. In verse 10, Jesus continues teaching by telling his followers to keep his commands, which in verse 12 he defines as, Love each other as I have loved you, and that if they do, they will remain at home in his love. For Jesus, Obedience is a relational category, not a behavioral one. That's such a weird sentence to me. I'm going to read it again. For Jesus, obedience is a relational category, not a behavioral one. This pattern is seen in other places throughout Scripture, most notably in Exodus 20 in the giving of the Ten Commandments. Before the first commandment is even uttered, God reminds the people of his relationship to them. I am God, your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of a life of slavery. We are not liberated from unwanted sexual behavior because of our obedience. Obedience is the fruit of our liberation. We're going to jump ahead a little bit here because he has a whole chapter on empathy, which is absolutely crucial to community, um, and the role that it plays in both your own recovery from unwanted sexual behavior by connecting with other people's stories, right? It's not just your struggle, but understanding the struggles of others and how you share that, and even the things that you don't share and attempting to connect with them in that way and how that can help you. Um, and we're going to completely skip over that, not because it's not important, but just because... I want to keep moving, and it was a whole chapter, and I think most people have a pretty good understanding of empathy. So we're going to jump ahead to the last little bit here on purpose and how community as a place for purpose uh, comes together. And it's an interesting image we have here. Uh, so reading from the book, uh, in, the, in the 90s, in the 90s, the African country of Namibia was in a decades-long struggle to save their wildlife from aggressive poachers. A meeting was convened where government officials posed the question, whom do we need to get to protect these animals? The government needed a workforce with an intimate knowledge of the animals, a vast knowledge of the bush, and an astute understanding of the black market contributing to the devastation of poaching. At the meeting, one official presented a counterintuitive and risky idea. The poachers! They should lead our conservation efforts! Years later, this idea became a reality, and today the notorious poachers of Namibia are at the forefront of the country's conservation efforts. You see, long before any Namibian took up poaching, they were exiled from their own wildlife reserves and forced into small plots of land to farm. This occurred in the 60s, when the apartheid government of South Africa controlled Namibia. In 1966, the United Nations told the apartheid to leave. But before they finally departed, they gave ownership of the Namibian wildlife to predominantly white landowners. 
Exiled from their native lands, the Namibians worked small farms that did not provide for their basic needs. In the face of sweeping injustice, they took to their former game lands for food and profit. As is the case with so many problematic behaviors, their poaching was rooted in the country's wounds and injustice. What ultimately brought transformation was the opportunity to take ownership of the land and fauna that had been stolen. Their healing was not in punishment, but in the opportunity to find new generative purpose. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here to pretty much the closing of this chapter. And he says, <clears throat> when pastors and community leaders ask me, what can be done about the epidemic of pornography and sex buying in our cities? Who can change this for the next generation? I often find myself saying, the addicts, the addicts who have come to know their stories. All right. And I think the way to look at this is to think back to the elements of unwanted sexual behavior, right? Your elements were unique to you. And that is because you are unique. That means that in a pre-fall sense, you were unique, you were created new unique, and now your, your elements of sin that <clears throat> make up your unwanted behavior are unique to you, your baggage is unique, your personality is unique, and that also means that your healing is going to be unique. I can't tell you what your purpose should be. I can I mean, I can in a really broad sense, right? Because Jesus tells us, like, love your neighbor as yourself and love the Lord your God. All right, there you go. That that's a there's your. I can say that with confidence. That's your purpose. But that's pretty broad. How do you actually apply that practically in your life? Well, that gets harder for me to tell you because that's unique to you. That's unique to your story and to your gifts and to your baggage and your scars and how God's healing is going to use that baggage and scars. And this brings us back to, well, two things. One, I can't tell you what your purpose is. Clearly, you need purpose. Purpose is one of the best th things we have for healing unwanted sexual behavior. That, that's really clear in all the literature that I've read. <clears throat> and it's one thing I can't give you because you have to kind of discover it yourself because your elements are unique. But that brings us back to community. There are very few things that are better <laughs> tools for discovering who you are, what your struggles are, and how you actually can regulate and learn how to use the stuff that you're made of in a better way than other people. Um, there are several things that I want to share here that I didn't put in my notes, so it might be a little scatterbrained, but I'll try to do my best. Um, one of the things I love to tell people is, <clears throat> I and I wish I could say where I found this from, because I'm not gonna be able to give credit, but I came across the idea from, I believe, a scientist who said there's lots of social animals out there, right? Wolves are, are social creatures, all right? Virtually all primates are social creatures. But humans are really the only creatures that we would ca not categorize not as social, but as hyper-social creatures. We desperately need other people. Um, there's a reason why... <clears throat> Um, isolation, uh, confinement, what's that called? When, when punishment is in prison is you're put into isolated confinement. That's not what it's called. Um, right? That's, that's punishment. It's punishment to just be by yourself for long periods of time. Not only is it punishment, uh, there's a great video on YouTube by Vsauce <clears throat> where he locks himself in a room for three days because... The literature shows that three days is about the borderline before you start experiencing neurological damage just from isolation. <clears throat> uh, if you watch movies like 
uh, oh, when Tom H- Castaway, when Tom Hanks gets stuck on a deserted island by himself for years, it's like the psychological damage of that is absolutely impossible to understate. It's unbelievable how much we need other people. Um, I came across an idea years ago that that's one of the main ways we stay sane is you have lots of thoughts and the way you judge whether your thoughts are sane or healthy or take your pick is you express them to other people and then you watch the other people to see how they react and whether those are (laughs) useful thoughts or not. So there's a, a whole bunch there to unpack. As always, I encourage people to go in and read these books because there's tons more there that I didn't get into tonight. Um, We need community. We need other people. You need to find people around you who will share in your life with you. And if part of that is incorporated of keeping each other accountable, that's okay, but it needs to be done in the context and through the lens of I want to see you succeed because I like you and I want to see you succeed and not in a sense of you're, you're breaking the rules and so I'm, I'm going to make you feel bad about yourself so you stop breaking the rules. It's No, you have a whole life that's going to be super cool and unique and let's see what you can do with that. I'll stop there. And as always...